a night as interminable as feverish dreams. A storm began when I got home, a storm of frightening violence. Never have I felt smaller. Sometimes the thunder rolled, crashing in from all sides. Sometimes it bolted straight down, a flickering of lights bursting into blinding bites of white. I was so sick that I trembled, thinking that I was no longer on earth but in the terrible sky itself. Liquefaction. The crashing of the water from the sky. No more earth, only an echoing space, overwhelmed and drowned in rage. The storm was illimitable. I had been tired, but a dazzling lightning flash intensified my vision, energized me, and as the thunderbolt hit, my alertness became a kind of sacred terror. I saw a wedge of light shining under the door. I got up to switch off the light. I was naked and hesitated before opening the door. I was certain that I would find a manual Kant waiting for me. He would not look like a corpse, filmy and translucent. He would be a shaggy and messy-haired young man. I opened the door, and to my surprise, find myself looking into empty space. I was alone. I was naked in the middle of one of the greatest rolls of thunder I have ever heard. George Bataille. Here, Bataille correctly represents the results of the Kantian notion of critique. Piety reduced to the rabid terror of the howling beast, the diminishing of the relevance of the human scale of the perception of phenomena, the dissolution of the rational poles of subject and object, and the overpowering energy of storms, the dissipation of spaces and entities into raging intensities, the destruction of resistances and equilibriums by immense forces of heat, light, and sound. The relation between the catastrophic disintegration of reason in such events and the power of critique is central to Kant's account of the preemptive defense mechanisms of the hierarchy of the faculties in the critique of pure reason. Kant differentiates the power of critique and the functioning of thought through the hierarchy of the faculties and the transcendent operation of the movement of necessary illusion. For Bataille, the general trajectory of thought, which is how he designates critique, must dissolve any such hierarchy of the faculties. This trajectory does not correct or justify an intellectual movement of the sensibility-driven expansionism, but is itself the accelerating drive of thinking to its own incandescent emulation. Before we undertake our chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of Nick Land's The Thirst for Annihilation, George Bataille and Virulent Nihilism, it's necessary to have in mind a history of the ideas presented in this text. The ideas are not exactly accessible for newcomers to modern and contemporary philosophy, so our task in this and the next episode is to provide some historical context and brief explanation for the concepts we'll be deploying throughout our analysis of Land's work. It may seem strange to some that we will not begin with the work of George Bataille, given the obvious fact that this book is an engagement with Bataille's thought. However, as we'll see in the first proper episode on The Thirst for Annihilation, the primary target of Land's account of Bataille and Land's work in general will be none other than a humble citizen of 18th century Königsberg, Prussia, one Immanuel Kant. A strange choice indeed, considering the vile and vitriolic depths the thirst for annihilation reaches, that we would be compelled to begin our journey with an innocuous, punctual, rational, and otherwise proper gentleman. Yet we should not let the perhaps too normal Kant fool us. To quote Heinrich Heine's work, Religion and Philosophy in Germany, pages 108 through 109, quote, The history of Immanuel Kant's life is difficult to portray, for he had neither life nor history. I do not believe that the great clock of the cathedral performed in a more passionless and methodical manner in its daily routine than did its townsman, Immanuel Kant. Rising in the morning, drinking coffee, writing, reading, dining, walking, everything had its appointed time, and the neighbors knew that it was exactly half past three o'clock when Immanuel Kant stepped forth from his house in his gray, tight-fitting coat with a Spanish cane in his hand and betook himself to the little Linden Avenue called after him to this day, Philosopher's Walk. What a strange contrast did this man's outward life present to his destructive, world-annihilating thought. In sooth, had the citizens of Königsberg had the least presentiment of the full significance of his ideas, they would have felt a far more awful dread at the presence of this man than at the sight of the executioner who can kill but the body. But the worthy folk saw in him nothing more than a professor of philosophy, and as he passed in his customary hour, they greeted him in a friendly manner and set their watches by him. End quote. 
To put matters slightly more concisely, on page two of The Thirst for Annihilation, Nick Land states, quote, Kant's critical philosophy is the most elaborate fit of panic in the history of the earth, end quote. And later on page three, he attributes to Kant's thought, quote, the runaway reconstruction of a planet, end quote. On these readings, Kant is a destroyer of worlds, the desacralizer of the holy, and the beginning of the end of time itself. But what does this matter? For this series, the purpose is twofold. First, because Land's primary enemy is Kant, it's necessary to begin at the source. Second, Bataille represents a tradition that attempts to move beyond Hegel, who himself moved beyond Kant. Without this primary background, the rest of Land's corpus becomes all the more intimidating. And so, we begin at the beginning. It's important to first understand a bit of the context behind Kant's first great work, The Critique of Pure Reason, before delving straight in. An easily overlooked detail is one found in the change of the title to the introduction to The Critique of Pure Reason between its first and second editions. In the first edition, the introduction was titled, quote, On the Idea of Transcendental Philosophy, end quote. Whereas in the second edition, it was changed to the title of the distinction between pure and empirical cognition. This change in title is crucial as it signifies a shift from an exposition of transcendental philosophy to a more simplified and historically tractable problem relating to the fundamental rift within which transcendental philosophy falls. The pure cognition of reference here is that exemplified by those progenitors and followers of what is known as the rationalist tradition. So this tradition, especially as it relates to the Kantian project, follows largely from the works of Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, and Christian Wolff, whereas the empirical cognition being referenced follows from the thought of Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Rationalism and empiricism are both internally constituted by a wide array of positions, many in contradiction with one another, even under the aegis of their own guiding concept. But in the critique of pure reason, Kant takes care to make both distinctions and conjunctions between many thinkers and their respective traditions where necessary. For example, he conjoins the empiricism of Berkeley and the rationalism of Descartes under the general heading idealism, yet he distinguishes between their positions by naming Berkeley's thought dogmatic idealism and Descartes thought problematic idealism in order to kind of positively reduce both their congruent and distinguishing features to the most fundamental units of articulation while at the same time exploding the frameworks of both in order to lay the ground for Kant's own transcendental idealism. Accordingly, we'll try to reduce this content even further to only the distinctions we feel are most relevant for this introduction. And with that said, let's return to the context here. When Kant speaks of pure cognition, he is referring to a tradition of rationalist thought characterized by a fundamentally metaphysical impulse, which seeks to lay claim to truths about the world through what is known as a priori reasoning. A priori means roughly before experience and denotes reasoning or knowledge which proceeds from theoretical deduction rather than from observation or experience. This is to say that rationalism as an enterprise, insofar as it relies on a priori reasoning, is characterized first and foremost by adherence to logical axioms and deductive inferences therefrom without final deference to observable reality as the arbiter of truth. Rationalist methods sometimes take empirical reality as first input, but seek to explain that empirical reality by reference to the abstract realm of reason alone, thus leading to some seemingly outlandish and anti-commonsensical but altogether enticing conclusions. A priori reasoning, and thus the rationalist enterprise with which Kant engages, has a correlated concept known as analyticity, and seeks to derive what are known as analytic truths. Analyticity is a sentential operation, which is to say that analytic statements are about the meanings of words themselves. Analyticity and analytic statements relate the subject of a sentence to its predicates, and vice versa. It's internally constituted and relies only on definitional truths so as to arrive at that which is universal and necessary, clear and distinct. The distinction between the a priori and the analytic is subtle, but one is more about form, the a priori, while another is more about content. The analytic. Both are independent of experience per se, and in fact, analytic arguments are a species of a priori arguments, specifically those species of statements called analytic a priori statements, such as all bachelors are unmarried, all squares have four sides, and so forth. But the distinction still stands. This is a distinction between logical form as such and the method of justification of statements by way of an analysis of the content of statements, which are themselves structured according to the a priori format. 
Universality and necessity are important to the rationalists because in seeking properly philosophical truth, which they might construe as the general interpropositional coherence of all particular analytic a priori and analytic a priori truths, rather than mere scientific truths about phenomena, they wish to find only those features of the world which are universally applicable to all phenomena and act as their unsurpassable logical grounding a ground in which must necessarily be true so as to finally put to rest any skepticism about their soundness or validity, thereby ensuring a perfectly rational and all-encompassing foundation for the world of thought, experience, and science itself. As Leibniz states in his monadology, the senses, although they are necessary for all our actual knowledge, are not sufficient to give us the whole of it, since the senses never give us anything but instances, that's to say particular or individual truths. Now, all the instances which confirm a general truth, however numerous they may be, are not sufficient to establish the universal necessity of this same truth, for it does not follow that what happened before will happen in the same way again. From which it appears that necessary truths, such as we find in pure mathematics, and particularly in arithmetic and geometry, must have principles whose proof does not depend on instances, nor consequently on the testimony of the senses, although without the senses, it would have never occurred to us to think of them. End quote. Where a priori metaphysics goes with its reliance on pure logical reasoning is as impressive as it is exasperating. Its defenders attempted, and still attempt, to prove or disprove the existence, nature, and attributes of God, pontificate on the soul, the infinitude or finitude of the universe, the nature and rule of causality, grace, redemption, and damnation. They haunt modernity with retrograde depictions of natural, ethical law, the nature of mind, principles of individuation and aggregation, and so on. Insofar as rationalism utilizes a priori metaphysics, it also succumbs to the pitfalls of this kind of reasoning. In order to understand Kant, however, we must not conflate the metaphysical arguments and conclusions of certain thinkers with their epistemology as such. Indeed, everything does tie together, the metaphysics, the epistemology, the ethics, etc., but the crux of the issue lies at the base, that is, the epistemology itself. It's the reasoning at which Kant takes aim, precisely because this variant of reasoning is the seed of the metaphysical impulse, an impulse which, as we'll see, generates incommensurable contradictions and absurdities, while still serving through fanciful and ornate feats of logical acumen to tie intelligence to humanity, and thus to dogmatic notions which have exercised control over intelligence for millennia. The dogmatic metaphysicians preceding him, Kant argued, imagined that they could demonstrate the truth of their doctrines in rigorous mathematical fashion, but metaphysical concepts lack the precision and intelligibility of mathematical concepts. At the same time, they put their trust in a dubious intellectual intuition that was not far from mysticism, and utilized supposedly clear and obviously true claims as their building blocks. This is part of the reason why they are known as dogmatic. They didn't sufficiently analyze the conditions that would render their presuppositions true, and if they did, they would not rigorously work through the conditions that render thinking itself possible. The dogmatic presuppositional ideas with which rationalists worked were called innate ideas. Rationalists held that innate ideas exist in the mind prior to and independently of experience, and are therefore justifiable starting points. Some examples of innate ideas would be the laws of logic, the soul, God, the persistence of identity over time, infinity, perfection, morality, and so forth. You could see how that could be problematic. So to sum up, rationalism proposes a view which links rationality to the truth about being as such, there's here a correlation between deductive thought and being, between object and subject, which proposes to render the claims of metaphysics necessarily and universally true. Rationalism claims to know and to be able to prove, through pure reason alone, the existence and nature of a transcendent realm, wholly separate from, but which nevertheless grounds material becoming. A realm to which materiality is subservient and owes an infinite debt. Rationalism has historically been tied up with theology and theocracy rather than the imminent plane of materiality and has become the seat of anthropocentric fancies regarding the communion of this species with the absolute. However, to be clear, Kant thought that we could attain a priori knowledge, and he actually had a three-part doctrine of the a priori, and we'll explain this in more detail in the second episode. But for now, it will suffice to note that Kant held that some features of the mind and its knowledge had a priori origins, i.e., 
must be in the mind prior to experience because using them is necessary to have experience. He held that the fact that mind and knowledge have these features are themselves a priori truths, i.e. necessary and universal, and that we can come to know these truths only by using a priori methods, i.e. we cannot learn these things from experience. Kant thought the transcendental arguments were a priori or yielded the a priori in all three ways. In this way, the name of his magnum opus, The Critique of Pure Reason, denotes at once a critique of pure reason and a critique of pure reason by pure reason. It's pure reason critiquing itself and setting limits to its own domain of application. This limitation is absolutely crucial. To quote Kant regarding the enterprise of rationalist philosophy, quote, so much there was deceptive that it is necessary to suspend the whole enterprise and to bring instead the method of the critical philosophy into play. This consists of examining the process of reason itself, of dividing and testing the human knowledge capacity in order to determine how far out its boundaries may be placed. End quote. Sometimes these concepts appear to be one thing while actually being another, and this is indispensable to Kant's project. For instance, Kant says that arithmetic was previously conceived of as being purely analytic a priori. That we can deduce the sum of 7 and 5 as being 12 was said to be both true a priori and analytically. Arithmetic was supposed to be an analytic a priori mode of deduction. Kant, however, shows that this isn't exactly the case. While it is true that 7 plus 5 equals 12 is in fact a priori, it is also synthetic rather than analytic. Kant defines synthetic statements as those statements where the predicate is not covertly contained within the subject, i.e. cannot be deduced from the concepts alone, but rather add to the subject in order to arrive at some further statement that is not contained within a concept. Synthetic judgments are therefore ampliative, or additive in nature, and tell us something about how the world really is. In the case of our above example, we can never find the concept of the number 12 within the concept 7, nor of 5, nor of addition, nor of sum. All of these concepts work together in a meshwork of sorts, one being added to another, finding their meaning wholly independent of one another, yet put together in such a way that we have the equation 7 plus 5 and then have to actually count or perform an arithmetic operation in order to arrive at the sum of the two numbers, thus arriving at the number 12. This is more apparent in larger numbers, since the operations are more complex and less intuitive, but the same principle still holds. Thus, Kant terms pure mathematics, arithmetic, Euclidean geometry, and later properly critical or transcendental metaphysics, and even his own project of outlining the structure of knowledge as being synthetic a priori. Something known completely a priori, but needing ampliative additions to the concepts in order to derive new knowledge, not knowable through either pure a priori, a posteriori, or analytic a priori means alone. We'll return to the absolutely central importance of the concept of the synthetic a priori later in the next episode. To continue, however, this brings to light another term, a posteriori. A posteriori means after experience or posterior to experience. Propositions known a posteriori require sensory experience of the world. Such propositions can be known only after experience, and because of this, are statements that are contingent rather than necessary, and require experience or factual confirmation in order to establish the truth of their claims. Synthetic a posteriori judgments are therefore those which first require a claim about the external world, which is then judged to be veridical or falsitical by reference to the world. Examples of a posteriori claims include this carpet is red, that dog is barking, Kant is annoying, and so forth, and become synthetic a posteriori judgments only by examining whether or not the claim is true by reference to whatever state of affairs in the world would render them true or false. It's important to point out that, like the distinction and congruence between the concepts a priori and analytic, a posteriori is not the same as synthetic. While both require experience in some capacity, the truth of an a posteriori claim comes from the fact that it can be known through experience, and the truth of a synthetic claim is about empirical verification of the way the world is as it relates to our representations and concepts. Again, like the a priori analytic distinction, this is, on the one hand, about the formal possibility of knowing what would make a statement true or false, and on the other hand, the means by which they are justified or unjustified.
A posteriori reasoning is the kind of reasoning that fed the empiricist machine and its skeptical assault on a priori metaphysics. Championed perhaps most prominently by David Hume, skeptical empiricism, or the empirical cognition named in the second version of the introduction to the Critique of Pure Reason, what was awoke Kant from what he dubbed his dogmatic slumber. Kant was formerly a rationalist and wrote in this vein prior to the Critique of Pure Reason, yet never totally abandoned this kind of thinking, as we'll see when we touch on his categories of the understanding in the next video. However, Hume's empiricism, which sought the destruction of a priori metaphysics in the light of the advances of scientific inquiry, a mode of inquiry based, or so Hume thought, on synthetic a posteriori reasoning, has seemed to reveal massive faults in the rationalist enterprise. Faults so massive that Hume felt all of metaphysics should be, quote, committed to the flames, so as to avert regressing as a species. Low stakes here. This was no mere abstract discussion for Hume. In his lifetime, he saw what political and epistemological ramifications both modes of thought could have on culture and human thought. Hume made it his mission to rebuild philosophy, only because he had first destroyed it. But how did Hume destroy traditional philosophy, and why does this matter for Kant or for accelerationism? So in order to arrive at the importance of Hume's thought for our purpose of reading Kant and Nick Land, we'll first lay out what we see as being the most important philosophical contributions made by Hume, namely the problem of induction, the undermining of causality and the principle of the uniformity of nature, and the destruction of the idea of the self. The first important contribution made by Hume to philosophy is known as the problem of induction. The problem of induction is the question of what the justifications for any growth of knowledge, specifically the knowledge that goes beyond a mere collection of observations, might be. In other words, induction is a form of reasoning in which we generalize about the properties of a class of objects based on observations of particular instances of that class. Induction, therefore, refers to the way in which we move from concrete examples, which share certain patterns, to the inference that all examples of a given class will necessarily hold to the pattern perceived in the particular instances. This operation, as you may notice, is a posteriori and synthetic, because it claims to relate to the way things actually are, and therefore requires empirical justification as the condition of any statements being judged to be either true or false. The attempted justification, then, is the synthetic operation, and it is only by way of empirical justification that we can add to our knowledge of the world. Induction also has a second and correlated outcome, which is that we can presuppose that a sequence of events in the future will occur as it always has in the past. For example, that the laws of physics will hold as they have always been observed to hold. Hume called this principle the principle of the uniformity of nature. Induction seems to be the way that science operates, and science is our best means of attaining knowledge of the external world. So why is induction problematic exactly? Let's take a classic example of induction, known as the black swan paradox, which is simple and goes as follows. Since all swans we have seen are white, we can therefore conclude that all swans are white. A reasonable thesis, yet this inference was shown to be false after the discovery of black swans. Well, simple enough, all we learn is that sometimes we're wrong and we merely have to amend our premises in light of new evidence in order to make more accurate predictions, right? All we learn is that induction, namely the way in which humans come to knowledge about the world, is a bit faulty. That knowledge is itself sometimes not really knowledge per se, but rather just a set of empirically informed beliefs about the way the world appears to us at a certain time and in certain instances. This is the role of synthetic a posteriori reasoning, after all. So what? Let's take another example, concocted by Carl Hempel, and named the Raven's Paradox, which goes as follows. 1. All observed non-black things have been non-ravens. 2. So non-black things are non-ravens. 3. So all ravens are black. If you look closely, you'll notice three things going on in this argument. First, you'll notice that premise one, all observed non-black things have been non-ravens, is logically equivalent to premise three, all ravens are black. Second, you'll notice that even though one and three are logically equivalent, three isn't justified by either one or two on the grounds of synthetic a posteriori inductive reasoning alone. We could, in fact, 
just like in the black swan example, find one raven that is not black, thereby annulling the entire argument. And third, piggybacking off of the second observation about the argument, the repeated observation of non-black ravens is simply not enough evidence in favor of the thesis that all ravens are black. So to put it another way, I can't say, here's a non-black non-raven, and another non-black non-raven, and another, and another, and another. Ah yes, therefore all ravens are black. The conclusion simply doesn't follow, even though the initial premise and the conclusion are logically identical. But this is how inductive inferences work. They seek to establish universal claims about general patterns by way of building up a body of evidence from observations of particulars. What Hempel's Raven's paradox shows us is that inductive inferences are not logically validated, but are mere estimations towards truth, a truth that induction can never give us, and crucially, a truth undercut by the logic of induction itself. But it also seems that rationalists, far from giving us clear and distinct, universal and necessary answers to our questions, frequently disagree on fundamental issues, and also frequently come into conflict with what inductive inferences tell us about the world in ways that are highly repeatable and scientifically rigorous. So what the hell is going on here? At this point, one may still ask, so what? Even if induction isn't logically validated, this can't possibly mean that we're unjustified in claiming that nature itself is uniform, or that our observation of causation is similarly unjustified, can it? Well, I'm glad you asked, because here is where Hume gets very interesting. Before Kant pedantically separated the a priori, the analytic, the a posteriori, and the synthetic, and a neat little Punnett square, just before acting like a total dick and destroying the whole thing with a monstrous synthetic a priori, Hume, in his book entitled An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, termed analytic a priori statements relations of ideas, and synthetic a posteriori statements matters of fact. Only with Kant did the distinctions we've discussed first come about, so at Hume's level of articulation, the concepts are still murky and intermingled. Now, Hume situated his formulation of the problem of induction within the context of his treatment of the concept of causation, where causation essentially denotes that process in which every event is preceded by its cause, and this cause brings its effect into being. Notice the temporal presupposition at work here. This will be of the utmost importance for Kant and even for Nick Land. Hume held, contrary to the rationalists, that causation was not on the firm axiomatic ground that the rationalists believed it to be on. Why? Because it is not a relation of ideas. It's not an a priori truth. Rather, it's a matter of fact. It's something we have to actually observe empirically. We can't subtract everything from the universe in a Cartesian thought experiment and still have causation somehow appear as being necessary to the relation of ideas. Analytic a priori ideas don't cause anything because the content is already covertly contained within the concept. Add to this the fact that ideas as such are inert abstractions and so cannot by themselves generate a concept which acts as the foundational relation between empirical phenomena, and you arrive at the conclusion that causation is itself a postulate arising from empirical experience, making causation a matter of fact. This seems innocuous enough, of course, Causation is still a matter of fact in this description, so things can't be that bad. Facts in the title. Well, think again, says Hume, because induction is the way in which we come to know all matters of fact. And since induction is problematic, and can at best provide us with fallible, contingent, and probabilistic inferences, as you have yourself already conceded, any of its inferences, including causation and the uniformity of nature itself, are therefore suspect and called into question. Notice that this is itself an a priori argument, therefore leading to a necessarily true conclusion. In addition, as Hume failed to recognize, this is a synthetic a priori argument because it takes in information from experience, yet derives necessarily true conclusions without the need for empirical justification after the fact. What kind of synthetic a priori postulate this is will be explained later. This is all well and good, but again, what does this matter? Where does it take us? Surely causation can't be far from the truth of the world, as it's such a stubbornly persistent phenomenon. Let's look at what Hume has to say about the regularities which undergird our concept of causation. Perhaps this can shed some light. First, Hume noted that in any experience of causation, we experience what he called spatial contiguity. That is, 
Objects standing in causal relations always share an immediate proximity in space. The classic example is that of two billiard balls. In order to play the game of billiard, if that's how you say it, I'm an American, so I call it pool. I claim ignorance here. One has to take the billiard stick, I presume, and hit one ball into another ball to score points. When you hit the ball, the effect is that the ball moves and hits another ball, which then moves in turn, unless you're me and just miss it altogether. Now, the act of moving the first ball requires that we first hit the ball by not missing it. That is, by encroaching into the space occupied by the ball with some amount of force and velocity. Hence, spatial contiguity. Simple enough. Next, the ball moves and hits another ball. Notice what we just said. Next. This next is the second aspect of causation, namely temporal succession. Something must encroach upon the space occupied by something else, interact with that object, and this engages a series of successive events that we can relate narratively in order to tell a story according to which events unfold in time. The final aspect of Hume's account of causation is necessary connection. Necessary connection states, exactly like the principle of the uniformity of nature, that what happens in causal interactions follows a set of rule-governed patterns from which nature does not deviate. If I hit the ball in such a way that it has always gone straight, it will not suddenly take a right angle upwards, angle back, and semi-straight to the emergency room. If events were not governed by such a necessary connection, things would be totally unpredictable, and anything at all could happen, at any time, given any cause whatsoever. Or at least so it would seem, hence its status as a stubbornly persistent illusion. Necessary connection is the connection, as well as the explanation of the connection itself. It's therefore both a feature of causation and of inductive theses used to justify particular causal explanations. These three features of causation, spatial contiguity, temporal succession, and necessary connection, taken together, Hume terms constant conjunction, which is just another name for causation on Hume's account of objecthood, known as bundle theory, which we'll briefly touch on later. First, however, we'll finish up our discussion of causation. It wasn't enough for Hume to show that causation was an inductive thesis, and therefore subject to scrutiny. He also had to show that something about it was in perpetual incongruence with our notions of it, and later, to show that this incongruence reveals something disastrous for philosophy. The crux of Hume's attack on causation has to do with the third notion inherent in the concept, namely necessary connection. According to Hume, the idea of a necessary connection between cause and its effect is produced in our mind when we repeatedly observe the constant conjunction of two events in time, one prior and one posterior. When this happens, the mind naturally considers one the cause of the appearance of the other. But Hume tells us to ask ourselves, what sense impression or empirical observation do we have of the necessary connection itself? We perceive two events, yes, but do we actually perceive the conjunction, the connection, between the two events? If you think about it for a minute, I think you'll say that the answer is simply no, we don't. Even if we were to explain the cause in terms of the transfer of momentum, or of gravity, or of information exchange, and so forth, this merely pushes the problem back a step, and we can do this ad infinitum. So the question arises again and again. What is the necessary, i.e. unchanging, unchangeable, always applicable, connection within those supposed explanations of causal interaction. Do we ever perceive that necessary connection? Again, no, we do not. They could always be otherwise and are constantly shown to be otherwise in the course of empirical observation and inquiry. If I drop a pen here on earth, I can expect it to hit the floor. I can do that a million times and I'll get the same result every single time. We could think of this as being a necessarily established fact until we take that same pen, perform exactly the same experiment in space. And what will happen there? The pen will not fall to the ground, it'll go up to the ceiling. So we can't establish necessary connection by way of an appeal to its possible status as an innate idea, because innate ideas, insofar as they are truthful at all, are merely ideas and not matters of fact, and therefore, don't play a role in empirical phenomena. In fact, ideas cannot come into play here because that would be an example of circular reasoning, or the fallacy of begging the question, because it's the genesis and therefore the validation of the idea of necessary connection we're attempting to establish. You simply can't use the idea of a phenomenon to justify itself when the idea is what is in question in the first place. 
Coupling the lack of empirical justification for this empirical content, where there should, in fact, be evidence, gets around the trope, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, because the problem is also a logical problem with induction as such. Induction is cut through at the heart by an inherent lack of its own justification, as we've seen above with the Swan and Raven examples. Inductive inferences never secure necessary and universal truth claims, as Leibniz noted, and Hume agrees with him in this instance. Induction, and the synthetic a posteriori reasoning, upon which it depends entirely, is based wholly upon contingent or possibly false premises. Therefore, for Hume, causation, and hence also the principle of the uniformity of nature, as it depends upon constant conjunction and its constituent element of necessary connection, are neither logically nor empirically validated, and therefore have no secure, rational, epistemological status. Why then the persistent illusion? For Hume, causation and the uniformity of nature are what he calls habits or customs of the mind. This doesn't mean that their habits, such as picking up smoking or customs such as those that vary from culture to culture, rather, habits or customs are simply the ways in which the mind works, the way it makes sense of the world. But these are not rationally defensible elements of the world as such. They're merely features of us and our minds, not features of reality itself. We should then, according to Hume, cease looking for reasons for causes. They simply aren't there for us to find. So, Hume undercuts philosophy in a few startling ways here. First, he shows that rationalism has only produced error, not the truth it sought. Second, he shows that even though synthetic a posteriori inductive reasoning is the only thing we really have, it still does not produce universal and necessary truth, but rather mere approximations and faulty ones at best. Third, that neither these approximations nor their method of justification are rationally defensible, as we saw in the Raven's paradox. Fourth, that the very connective tissue of all inductive inferences is merely a habit of the mind, not a feature of the world. And fifth, that causation and the uniformity of nature are among these rationally unfounded ideas brought about by mere habits of the mind. So far, what Hume has shown us is that some seemingly obvious features of the world previously thought to be fundamental, and in fact presupposed in any colloquial common sense or metaphysical account of the world, are really just overextensions of the mind when it attempts to cover over narrative gaps left by a distinct lack of sense impression where they should instead be found. But what is the function of this narrative that habitually extends beyond its own domains? Generally speaking, causal narrative is a way in which an individual is oriented in the world, a means for navigation through conceptual, historical, physiogeographical, moral, political, theological, and socio-semantic spaces which require a sense of meaningful communication of ideas between individual acting agents. But what narrative presupposes, and indeed aims at, is a sense of coherence, a binding together over time. Without the temporal binding of causal narrative, there could be no coherence of self, and thus meaning would seem to lose relevance if not be altogether lost. Yet it is precisely the seat of narrative towards which Hume will now turn. The notion of a substantial self will be the next illusion exposed and dispensed of. The following extended quote from Book 1, Part 4, Section 6 of Hume's A Treatise of Human Nature will help us understand his reasoning. Quote, it must be some one idea that gives rise to every real idea. But self or person is not any one impression, but that to which our several impressions and ideas are supposed to have a reference. If any impression gives rise to the idea of self, that impression must continue invariably the same through the whole course of our lives, since self is supposed to exist after that manner. But there is no impression constant and invariable. Pain and pleasure, grief and joy, passions and sensations succeed each other and never all exist at the same time. It cannot, therefore, be from any of these impressions or from any other that the idea of self is derived. And consequently, there is no such idea. For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception of other, of heat or of cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception, 
and never can observe anything but the perception. End quote. Typically, the self is considered along two lines. The first is that of a firm, self-identical mental agent who is exempted from the laws of material reality and, as such, freely chooses its actions. The second is the neuroscientific account posited by many thinkers, including Thomas Metzinger, Douglas Hofstetter, Terence Deacon, and, to some extent, Daniel Dennett, where lower-level neuronal loops generate a hierarchy of increasingly abstract levels of cognition, culminating in an I, or a self, which experiences only its own highest level abstract and self-referential loops. On this account, all that the I, or the self, really is, is the reality of these material neuronal loops, but it is unable to perceive itself as purely neuronal through introspection. Hume's trick, however, is to undermine the notion of a firm, self-identical, substantial self without recourse to either the first or second iterations of selfhood described above. Hume merely provides a description of a stream of consciousness, thus demonstrating that, as Slavoj Zizek states on page 719 of his magnum opus Less Than Nothing, quote, the stable identity of the self is not a spontaneous illusion of our experience, but the result of our imposing upon our immediate experience a set of metaphysical concepts. For Hume, the notion of the self requires a persistence over time encapsulated in the narrative which would therefore have a substantial referent. And this referent, in order to know it and thus claim that it exists in any meaningful way, must have some corresponding sensible impression, as all our knowledge comes by way of empirical sensible impressions on an empiricist account. But all Hume finds when peering inside is an influx of sensations and dispositions, nothing permanent or stable. Therefore, the self, if it is anything at all, must be the referent of all impressions themselves, as it is not itself a sensible referent. But how to make sense of this? Hume's conclusion is that we are safe to say that where there is nothing but pure diversity, there can be no stable identity, and therefore no self at all. The self is a metaphysical illusion, of which we have no experience whatsoever, however persistently we might slam our fists. So to cap off our excursion with David Dr. Doom Hume, I want to conduct a little thought experiment with you. It won't take much time, don't worry. All I ask is that you simply do the following. Think of a movie. Any movie. Doesn't matter if you choose Alien or if you're wrong. Now ask yourself, why did you choose that movie among all the other movies you could have chosen? You could have chosen any movie you've ever seen. Or any movie you want to see. Or maybe you're a film major and you're thinking about a film that doesn't exist yet and you want to bring it to life. So why among this breadth of possible movies did you choose the one that you chose? You can easily give some reasons, like, I saw it yesterday, or I'm going to see it soon, or the many saints of Newark irreparably scarred my perception of something that I love, so it's inevitable that I would have chosen it due to the massive trauma inflicted. These are all good reasons, and I validate your trauma, but that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is this. At what point in your thought process did you choose the movie you chose? Take it further. At what point did you choose for that movie to pop into your head? Or at what point did you choose or choose to articulate the reasons for your choice? At what point did you choose for the set of other possible movies to pop into your head? And then choose among those possibilities. At what point, finally, did you choose to choose that movie? If you're being honest with yourself, I think you'll come to the conclusion that you never actually chose to do any of these things at all. Each alternative, each reason, each so-called choice just popped into your head, seemingly out of nowhere, without you choosing for the popping into being to happen at all. In fact, you could not have chosen. There simply is not enough time for you to run such a large, complicated, and elaborate program consciously. I didn't allow you enough time, and I promised I wouldn't. It would not be temporarily possible to have done this feat consciously. Rather, your brain did it for you, quote unquote, and then presented it seemingly from out of nowhere. There's a second reason why you could not have truly chosen this movie for yourself, and it's tied to the first reason. This is due to the fact that you cannot think a thought before it's thought. If you could think a thought before it's thought, that means that you would have retroactive access to the thinking of thoughts by way of the act of the thinking of thoughts. 
In other words, you'd be stuck in an infinite regress or a vicious loop. The problem goes something like this. I think thought X only because I first thought the meta thought X sub one, which I only thought because I first thought meta thought X sub one sub one, which I only thought because I first thought meta thought X sub one sub one sub one, then X sub one sub one sub one sub one, and so on out to infinity. To think a thought before it's thought is a temporal and logical absurdity because you would have to think each thought and each meta thought about each thought and each meta thought about each meta thought before ever thinking a thought. But this simply cannot happen. It's Zeno's paradox of the mind. Your brain can process whatever it is that a thought consists of, but each thought is generated anew from neuronal pathways, which register as biases and heuristics ready at hand for cognition without quote unquote you ever being involved in the process. The process of metacognitive thought generation itself is not presented to experience directly, and the representation of the process is all that thought truly appears to be to the conscious mind. In fact, insofar as quote-unquote you identify yourself with your thoughts and your memory-based narrative representations of your own experiences, you are only ever a representation that happens to frequently refer to itself as if it were the author of itself its own actions, and its own thoughts. You, or the self, is a model of the world, which becomes a problem only through the act of the mind taking the content of experience, including thoughts themselves, as objects of thought. And this empirical self, what Kant will later call the inner self, or the empirical ego, is itself a representation generated by the stimulus of the mind, a problem that generates an infinite, insoluble loop out of itself. What's more, every experience must, by physical and physiological necessity, already be a kind of memory due to the fact that the laws of physics govern the transmission of electrical stimulus, and this happens in time before it is represented to you. So every experience and every thought is already a delayed representation of something that has already happened, and so the you that just is the representation of the pure act of thinking don't worry, we'll cover what this means later, is simply barred from truly and effectively interacting with itself thanks to the laws of physics and a priori temporal progression. There is a way around this, but we'll get to that in the next video. And so the self is only ever what the brain does while it's busy doing something else. Or is it? Notice the following. In the course of this thought experiment, and while reading Hume's account, we don't merely lack a sensible impression of self. Rather, we have an impression of a lack of impression of the self. These two statements may seem nearly identical on the surface, but dig deeper and you'll notice something interesting. On the first account, namely the lack of an impression, there should be no reason whatsoever for the idea of self coming into being. No impression equals no idea. And in fact, for Hume, we don't even have the idea of the self, as odd as that may seem. For Hume, the self and all other hypothetical objects are without an essential substance underlying the properties of that object. According to John Locke's so-called substance theory, properties inhere in an underlying substance. For Hume, however, properties are knowable via sense impressions, but substances as metaphysical entities are not knowable via sense impressions. And given that his empirical epistemology demands sense impression of a hypothetical object as a first principle for any truly adequate claim to knowledge, substances must therefore be jettisoned. Like a strange attractor in mathematics, for Hume, properties inhere in nothing but dynamic processes and revolve around a fundamental absence of substance, much like a whirlpool. Therefore, on a Humean account, there is no substantial self outside of its properties, as the properties ascribed to the self point to nothing beneath themselves with a basis in sense impression. This is what Hume termed the bundle theory of perception, wherein each impression is supposedly free-floating and substance-independent, yet adhere together in a semi-arbitrary manner, which the mind then coalesces into a perception, i.e. a picture of a thing or an entity which it deems existent, even when nothing at all is there to bind them together. There are merely properties which are bundled together, forming the illusion of something behind them, guaranteeing their coherence. 
However, the transition from lack of an impression to impression of a lack signifies something incredible and is the precise passageway from Hume to Kant. Hume attempted to demonstrate how there is no self because there are no impressions of it, instead merely impressions of ideas and sensations. But what is important to understand is that while Hume relies heavily on the concept of habit and sense impression in the formation of ideas, he is unable to account for the ideas of habit or of sense impression themselves. This may not seem obvious at first, and you might ask, aren't habit and sense impression just concepts we can derive from the very real fact of empirical experience, which are then in turn posited as the basis for our knowledge of the world? Ask yourself this question. Is your experience of the world composed of discrete, disunified sensations, or of a relatively coherent unity passing through time and happening in space? Reflection on thought and experience may give rise to discrete experiences without a coherent unity in some cases, but experience in general doesn't work this way. If Hume wants to posit the mere play of sensible impressions and habits as the basis of knowledge, whence comes the impression of impression or the impression of habit? Hume's epistemology undercuts itself at this point because these mere appearances, with no unifying factor undergirding them, cannot cohere into anything like genuine knowledge of the world, its particulars all the way down. In order to have entities, on his version of empiricism, something must bind things together, but nothing does except to have an impression, which are themselves mere names for bundles imposed by the mind with no unifying factor. Yet in a second term, Hume undercuts himself again precisely by positing these terms, habit and impression, as the elements of experience and therefore of knowledge. In other words, by positing and relying on habit and impression, Hume nevertheless implicitly retains a sense of something that underpins, coheres, and makes propositions about them true. He cannot account for this unity when closely scrutinized, but his movement is actually towards a subject or a self that coheres habit and impression into something sensible and capable of guaranteeing truth, no matter what he actually says. And this brings us to the final problem in the Humean system. Hume posits a subject that is passive with regard to sense impression, wherein phenomena are not mere appearances, but existent objects as in order to account for their objecthood outside of a flux of properties, they must be unified. Yet this unification happens nowhere in sense impression. Instead, it happens in the human mind, according to Hume. But the question then becomes, where does the passive subject gain its active power of unification if all it receives are stimuli in this passive way, and how can we know that? Where's the power in servility? What our thought experiment attempted to do, although I didn't say it at the time, was align ourselves not with a lack of impression of the self, a la Hume, but with the impression of the lack itself. Because, you see, for Kant, the void left in the wake of the Humean critique is precisely what the self actually is. The void, the strange attractor, is the self. To quote Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, page 331 in my edition, Norman Kemp Smith translation, quote, The simple and in itself completely empty representation, I, we cannot even say that this is a concept, but only that it is a bare consciousness which accompanies all concepts. Through this I, or he, or it, the thing which thinks, nothing further is represented than a transcendental subject of the thoughts. It is known only through the thoughts which are its predicates, and of it, apart from them, we cannot have any concept whatsoever, but can only revolve in a perpetual circle, since any judgment upon it has already made use of its representation. End quote. And so, for Kant, the brain generates a void known as the self, which is still, in the end, an irreducible point of reference. And yet, it seems that Kant is holding on to something here. He names it a transcendental subject. But what does that mean? And how can a void, absence, or lack also be something? Doesn't this revert to Locke's pre-Humean and pre-critical substance theory? To answer these questions, we'll finally have to come to terms with the key notions of the Kantian system itself. The transcendental, the phenomena, the noumena, and a priori time. It's time we finally turn, in the next episode, to the transcendental aesthetic.